eternal God in this most holy of holy weeks, where we remember the passion, persistence, and perseverance of your son, all the way down to Via Della Rosa, to Golgotha, to the sepulcher, and up again in resurrection. We know, Lord, whenever you call men and women to preach or to teach or to declare your word in your name, you take the risk of putting treasure in broken vessels, clay vessels, fragile vessels. But you do it that the excellency of the power might be of thee and not of us. So hide us, hide me today behind your cross, cover me in your blood, and by your grace, somehow let the words of my feeble mouth be acceptable in thy sight. O Lord, our strength and blessed Redeemer. Amen. Amen. I have been so humbled, Father, to be asked to do these lectures um, beyond anything that I can express. They have pushed me hard, but to come from the backwoods of North Carolina, <laughs> from Washington County, a schooled system that did not even desegregate fully until the 1970s, where my mother, who was 80 some years old, was the first woman to integrate the secretarial pool and is still living today and working her last year, 50 some years. My father who gave his life and time, who could have gone anywhere in this country, he, by 1960s he had double master's degrees working on his doctoral degree, but he took a vow of poverty and went back home to Eastern North Carolina to help desegregate the schools and in some ways probably shorten his life uh, fighting against racism and fighting against poverty. He died in 1988, almost the last the year I was to finish divinity school at Duke University. And to come from a school where when I was a senior in 1980, I was the first Af person, African American, to serve as student government president the whole year because until 1979 in the school I attended, the racism was still so thick that they elected a black student government president and a white student government president, a white homecoming queen and a black homecoming queen and one served one semester and the other served the other semester and even though I was in the I was a thespian in the theater any part that required a white person to touch or kiss a black person uh, or, or to, to a male and a female to kiss each other in a play a black or white person could not play counter to that person not 1881, <laughs> but 1981. And I went to a school that was considered rural, poor, and deficient in some ways. Went to a little, little college that was founded in 1910, North Carolina Central University, first black university state supported in North Carolina. Went to Duke, then went to Martinsville, Virginia, and pastored a, a city that when I went there in the 1989 was, looked like you had stepped back in time 30 years, 40 years. And then came back to North Carolina, pastored the Greenlee Christian Church and inside of four months pastoring was told by the doctors I'd probably never walk again without a walker on a wheelchair because of a chronic disease in 1993. And then 
pursued my doctoral degree at Drew University. And remember, one of the administrators telling me when I, walk, when I rolled on the campus in my wheelchair, don't feel bad if you don't finish, because we've never had a person at this level of disability to finish, to finish this program. And they've come through all of that, and all of the death threats, and all of the craziness, and then to be invited to be here at St. John for a whole year. I didn't even know what a St. John Franciscan chair was when the father first called me. I said, I can't come spend time at St. John. I'm in the movement. I thought it meant every day of the week. I didn't know. I ignored his um, email for first. I, I thought they had made a mistake. Uh, I am truly humbled by God, and I am clear. That's why I pray it every time I preach a sermon. God, whenever you take the risk of calling men and women to declare your word, you take the risk of putting treasure in trash, treasure in earthen vessels, easily broken, terribly flawed, but you do it that the excellency of the power might be of thee and not of us. So thank you, St. John, for welcoming this country boy from North Carolina uh, to be at this institution. Father asked me to preach today. <laughs> and I said, well, my lecturing is preaching and my preaching is lecturing. So we will um, do what thus we believe the Spirit is saying in this Tuesday, on this Tuesday, the day after the first Moral Monday, because you know the first Moral Monday was when Jesus overturned the tables in the temple. That was the Monday of Holy Week. And I've been thinking about something. Jeremiah 22 says this, verse 1 and 3. And this is in the Message Bible. Here are God's orders. Go to the royal palace and deliver this message. Tell the king of Judah, any who sit on David's throne, tell all of them, tell all of the politicians, tell all of the officials, tell all of the people who move, who work in the palace. This is God's message to all of you in power. Attend to matters of justice. Set things right between the people. Rescue victims from the exploiters. Do not take advantage of the immigrant, the orphan, the widow, and stop murdering people with your policies. And if you obey these commands, then the kings who follow in the line of David will continue to go in and out of the palace gates mounted on horses and riding on chariots. But if you don't obey these commands, I swear, God says, God says, I swear by myself that this nation will end up a heap of rubble, and so will this palace. There's, then I want to go to Jesus' first sermon, the sermon that almost got him killed the day he preached it. Somehow God mystically allowed him to move between the people that were trying to throw him off the cliff. Luke chapter 4, verse 18 and 19. he just come out of the wilderness experience. He was beginning his public ministry that would last barely three years. And this is what almost got him killed that day and what eventually did get him killed. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, for he hath anointed me to preach the good news to the poor. He hath sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, and recovering of sight to the blind, and to set at liberty those who are bruised, and to declare the acceptable year of the Lord, the acceptable year of the Lord. And then Matthew 25, verse 41, Jesus says this, as he's headed toward the cross, knowing that he's going to die, knowing that, the, that his face has been set like flint toward Calvary's hill, he, sa he says, Matthew 25, verse 41, then God will say, or the king will say to those on his left, depart from me. You who are cursed into an eternal fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. For when I was hungry as a nation, you gave me nothing to eat. 
I was thirsty and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger, an immigrant, and you did not invite me in. I needed clothes and you did not clothe me. I was sick and in prison and you did not look after me. And they will answer, Lord, when did we as a nation see you hungry, thirsty, or a stranger, or needing clothes, or sick, or in prison, and did not have, help you? And he will reply, truly I tell you, whatever you did not do for the least of these, you did not do it for me. Then they will go away to eternal punishment, but the righteous to eternal life. Some things with God never changes. A case for a conservative Christian. <laughs> Some years ago, I announced at the Wild Goose Festival, which is a very progressive gathering, an eclectic group of Christians and people of faith all over the world, I came at night, preaching at night, out in the backwoods of a field in the country, and I announced that I was a theological conservative. In fact, I said I was so conservative that I wanted to liberally spread my theological conservatism everywhere. Amen. Now, I don't, I don't actually believe there's anything such as a left Christian, a right Christian, a conservative Christian, or liberal Christian. In my faith tradition, we don't talk like that. You're either Christian or you're not. You're either pregnant or you're not. But since we are in a culture that does, I want to reclaim the word conservative and declare that I am a proud theological conservative. Now, I have some people to blame for this, Reverend. I, I, I have to blame my grandmother, from whom I learned applied theology long before I learned systemic, systematics theology. My grandmama once told me, son, remember that what the Lord has said, the Lord meant it, whether you like it or choose to follow it or not. If God said it, that settles it. It doesn't matter what you say. If God said treat people right, then you better treat people right. That was her applied theology. But I also have to blame my mama, my mother, who sang and played those old hymns to me as a boy. So I sat with her on the piano stool. Uh, before we had what was called contemporary hymns, those old conservative hymns, like, um, oh, for a faith that will not shrink, though pressed by every foe, that will not tremble at the brink of any earthly woe. That's what I learned when I was a boy. Or my father, he's to blame, surely God rest his soul. He took his faith in God more seriously than anyone I knew. My father was a preacher, justice, activist. He would leave home to help people who were victims of racism and oppression and injustice with literally no money in his pocket and sometimes no transportation, depending only on his thumb to hitch a ride. All the education he had, all the advantages, but he, all, he, he was driven to be among the least of these. And I once asked him, how could, can you move with such faith? And he said to me, son, God never changes. And since God's, one of God's name is Jehovah Jireh, which means I will provide, who am I not to trust and believe what God has said? So I'm a born, bred, and trained conservative, which is to say, I have deep struggles with those who tend to call themselves conservative today, who liberally resist and ignore so much of God's character. They say so much about what God says so little and so little about what God says so much, and this is contrary to conservatism because to conserve means to hold on to the essence of something. 
Now, this confusing methodology is not new. During slavery, there were those who claimed deep adherence to Scripture in their support of slavery and racism. They claimed that they were adhering to a strict interpretation of Scripture. They started, however, with a desire for the economic evil of slavery, and then they pulled out a few texts to build a whole system of injustice. They created a heretical ontology regarding the red man and the black woman while ignoring the multiplicity of texts that condemned human oppression, mistreatment of the poor, the stranger, and the least of these. Though claiming to be biblicist, they ignored as much of the Bible as they could. They engaged in a false reading. They even created something called a slave Bible when they finally knew that some slaves were going to read. So they created a slave Bible for so-called slave preachers and they would go in with charcoal and mark out all of the passages that had anything to do with liberation. During the civil rights movement, there were many who found ways to dismiss the biblical call for justice and righteousness. Some literally declared, in the name of God, that God ordained segregation. Others, like members of Dr. King's own black, predominantly black denomination, were so liberal in their dispelling of God's demands, they claimed to be conservative, but they were so liberal in dispelling God's demands that they criticized Dr. King and said he was not acting like a preacher when he was engaged in civil rights and social justice. They claimed they claimed to be the conservatives and that Dr. King and others were liberal socialists. And yet at his first speech in Montgomery, when some people were questioning what was going on, Dr. King sounds like a conservative. Right. You ever heard that first speech in Montgomery? Y'all read it sometime. The first one in 1957, 58, that first speech, the first one when he only had about 10 minutes to prepare because they, the boycott had worked the first day and he was trying to explain what was going on. Listen, listen to that. Listen, they sound, sound real conservative to me. He said, some are saying that we are wrong. But we are not wrong in what we're doing. If we're wrong, the Supreme Court of this nation is wrong. If we're wrong, the Constitution of the United States is wrong. If we're wrong, God Almighty is wrong. If we are wrong, Jesus of Nazareth was merely a utopian dreamer that never came down to earth. If we're wrong, justice is a lie. Love has no meaning. And we are determined here in Montgomery to work and to fight until justice rolls down like waters and righteousness like a mighty stream. That, that's conservative. That's holding on to the essence of the faith. Later in his life, Dr. King had to remind others that if you read and accept the whole counsel of God, if you read and believe the triune God, you must challenge the triune evils of racism, poverty, and militarism. And it is my belief, he said, in these shifting times when so many are trying to promote a kind of a benign and anemic Christianity that reduces the image of God to a mere sanctifier of our nation, no matter what injustices she commits. They try to turn God into nothing more than a spiritual prosperity slot machine. We must remind ourselves to hold on to a faith that will not shrink and declare that with God, some things never change. When Isaiah, when Jeremiah, excuse me, looked at the political state of Israel in his day and God was calling him, Jeremiah didn't, was ready to quit, but God's word was like fire shut up in his bone. Even when he told God he wasn't going to talk anymore, he couldn't help himself. The nation of Israel and the cultural leaders had forgotten that God did not change. And they were big, the people were adjusting the religion and the public policy and its values to favor the wealthy, to ignore at, or sanctify injustices, to abandon mercy and canonize greed. They were literally adjusting the requirements of God to fit their own plans and premeditated schemes. And Jeremiah is called, as it is always with the prophets, he was called to call the religious culture, cultists and the culture back to God's original intent. 
So God tells Jeremiah, you better go down to the palace. And you better preach real conservative. You better remind the people what I said. That my focus is always on the poor. That, 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 that I transcend labels and political alliances and situational ethics. That the greatest thing that you must be concerned about is how are the poor, the children, the vulnerable, and the stranger being treated in your midst. And if you don't pay attention to this, then I will destroy this nation and make it like rubble. Protecting the rights of the poor is conserving God's intent. Building a government that cares for all is conserving God's intent. Love for the least and the left out, enjoy lifting those who've been abandoned is conserving God's original intent. A nation can't legislate evil and harm against the poor and think that as that nation, its bombs, missiles, and weaponry is going to protect it. The only protection for a nation is to stop it. Stop murdering. Stop hurting the poor. Stop abusing the widows. Stop using your policies to destroy people. Otherwise, that nation will always be on shaky ground. Then God said it again a thousand years after he used the prophet Isaiah, Jeremiah, when Jesus came, the religious cultists, when Jesus was born, had been hijacked. The moral and righteous standards of faith had been hijacked. They had changed what the Lord had said. They were just in faith to serve the few, the wealthy, the privileged. There are those who wanted to segregate access to God in God's name. And Jesus goes into the synagogue where it's happening, which was both then a place of politics and a place of religion. In verse 16 of Luke 4, Jesus, God's own son, comes in, opens the word. It's like the word of God opening the word of God because Jesus was the word, the Bible. He opens it, a scroll, no indexes, no concordance, an unmarked scroll. And deliberately, despite all the passages that were available to Jesus, he anchors his ministry and his message in the prophets, specifically Isaiah 58, 59, 60, and specifically 61. The spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has pre anointed me to preach good news to the poor. Jesus, in other words, as a young generation sometimes says, said, look, don't get it twisted. As God's anointed one, and I say to those who will partake and follow in this anointing, our vocation has always been to care for those whom God calls, whose God is concerned. It is to engage in the work of liberation of the poor, the blind, the captive, the oppressed, the outcast. Can you, can you imagine how significant this is when we talk about what is normative preaching for Jesus to begin his preaching ministry with his focus on the margins of life, the poor. Now there's a book, Philip East wrote a book about Luke and, 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 and uh, uh, Acts in the time of Jesus. And he talks about how at that time, it, was been, it would have been traumatic in society for Jesus to stand up and give the pride of place to the poor the very ones who are at risk and vulnerable in the world, to declare that we are anointed to become agents of God, not merely for personal edification, that the primary evidence of our anointing is how we use what God has given us in service to the liberation of the poor. The primary power of God's anointing is the power to show uncommon grace. The anointing produces the ability to address the death of our times. The anointing produces prophets who will not merely serve the culture, but who will engage in a counterculture in Jesus' name. The anointing produces prophets that save the church from being a mere consecrated club and instead makes it a prophetic community. Then Jesus said this, the good news to the poor, in the midst of the Roman domination. He says, look, Caesar has it wrong. Because in that day, in Caesar's day, the aristocracy continually 
reminded others of their superior position in Jesus, in Jesus' day, in the days of Caesar. The aristocracy was always conspicuous in their consumption and their entourages in the city, says R. McCullen in his study on the Roman culture. Their dress, their education, their titles, and the rich, greedy, wealthy insistence that the law discriminate on their behalf. Hmm, sounds interesting and familiar. In Roman society in Caesar's day, there were those of the du Duracons who were ex ex exiled for capital crimes. In other words, they killed somebody, they merely got exiled. But the other 99% of the population, when they hurt somebody, kill somebody, they were crucified, fed to wild beasts, or forced to work in mines for much lesser crime. The ruling class looked down on those who earned a living by manual labor. Cicero described the majority of the Roman society as sortus urbis et thots, the filth and the dregs of the city. How extraordinary it must have sounded to an audience in Greco-Roman city of, 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 it, for the Lucian Jesus to begin his ministry by specifying the poor, the patokos, those who've been made poor by the exploitation of human rules and regulation as the primary recipients of God's power. <laughs> Why? Because with God, some things never change. God said it in Jeremiah. God said it at the beginning of the ministry of Jesus. God says it at the end. Walter Wink, who used to be at Union, wrote a book called Engaging the Power. And he said, wherever the spirit is present, it puts forth a different value than the value of our culture. Because our society produces a unique value to money that makes wealth the highest value. And the church has to be careful not to be seduced into considering people like the world considers people. How much profit can that person make you? Salvation in Luke 4.18 is God's initiative to bring wholeness back to the creative order. It is meant to save humanity from its inhumanity. God desires to save us from anything that oppresses us, racial injustice, economic injustice, and anything that works against the solidarity of the human community. And the contemporary church and church institution need to hear this afresh because too often the church has become so accommodative to the worship of wealth that its theology is often viewed as a justification of economic injustice. In Jesus and the Disinherited, Howard Thurman wrote, this is the position of the disinherited in every age. What must be your attitude toward the rulers and controllers of the political, social, and economic life. Jim Wallace calls it prophetic spirituality. Bishop Tutu called it the spirituality of transformation. This is the spirituality that calls us to be suspicious of concentrations of wealth and privilege and power and to mistrust any ideological rationalization that justifies subordinating people and to become specifically sensitive to the poor, the disenfranchised, the stranger, and the outsider. The anointing of the Holy Ghost pushes us not to accept things the way they are. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, for he hath anointed me to preach good news to the poor, healing to the brokenhearted. The anointing of God's Spirit makes us be aware and concerned about all people's personhood. You know, when I took economics, the professor actually told us that most economic theories write off five to 10 percent of the population at any given time. They say that's the best you can do. But the value system of the Holy Spirit won't allow you to do that. When we have had what Dr. William Turner, a professor preaching and pneumatologist at Duke University called when, we, when he lectured to us, a crisis experience of conversion. You see, to meet the anointed one named Jesus, him who went to the cross and got up on the third day morning, is to have a crisis experience. <laughs> it, it, you, everything about your orientation is shifted. In other words, as, as Dr. Turner would say, and I would paraphrase, when the Spirit moves and we are saved, born again, changed, filled, sprinkled, baptized, however you want to describe it, what ought to follow is a challenge to the way things are. 
because being moved by the Spirit of God necessitates a quarrel with the way things are in the world because the world is out of kilter with the ways of God. That's why no matter how much one uses the language of the church, you can call yourself conservative, liberal, whatever you want to call it. No matter how often one says, I trust God, I'm born again, I'm filled with the Spirit, if the result of that experience is not a liberation focus, if the church speaks of Christ but defends the powerful and says nothing and more importantly does nothing about the social thing that ravages men and women's lives, then the claim of being church and being in the spirit must remain terribly suspect because with God, some things never change. Matthew 25 is talking about the complete reordering of society that must happen now. Otherwise, nations will stand under the very judgment of God. Now, there are some who say, well, as people of God, to be truly conservative, our concern should be private, soul-saving, private devotion, private praise, private and personal morality that addresses the issues of the inner man only. Well, I believe in the transformation of the inner man, but I grew up in a tradition that said if God is working on the inside, it'll show on the outside. <laughs> There are some that would say the church should have no real voice in social cooperative liberation, but they are dismissing too liberally much of what God says. Across our nation and our world, we ought to hear this today, these three scriptures, because we're living in some tough times. We're living in times driven by the false worship of a market morality. We see inequality in our economy that we haven't seen since the Great Depression, despite all these churches, all of the pulpits. It's almost as though the society is no longer afraid of having a pulpit in town. No longer afraid that there's gonna be a critique from a higher quarter. We have more wealth than at any time of history and more child poverty than at any time of history. That's the ugly reality of America the wealthiest country in the world, the most poor children in some way per capita in the world. There are some, of, some people who literally want us to have pity on billionaires and burdens on the poor. They want us to inflict more pain on the poor. We have politicians from a president down who claim they are being faithful while pushing policies, immigration policies, voting policies that literally pander to bigots and pander to racism. Never before in history has so much money been spent to resist the struggle for equality. The gross sums of money being spent to take us backwards are lewd and pornographic. It is blatant. It is arrogant. These are troubling times. Corporations are treated like people. People are treated like things. Banks are the object of worship. The military budget is fed until it is bloated while the poor are hungry. There's, that there's a sinful use of usury and interest against students, leaving them with mass debt while we forgive banks and financial institutions who destroy our lives. We bail out them with our money and then with no interest, and then those banks turn around and lend us our own money back at high interest. We must know there's a better way. And in the midst of these changing times, we must know there is a standard that never changes. It is a standard of God as it relates to the poor, as it relates to liberation, that we as people of faith must not be afraid to declare. We are in a nightmare of regressive public policy. It is mean, it is oppressive, and it is taking us in the wrong direction. These backward policies and oppressive politics want us to accept an anemic faith and selling out to the highest bidder, but we cannot. In our private and public politics, we've become too accustomed to committing so much, so much attention, violence against the poor. It's not just the physical violence, it's the literal attention violence against the poor. You can go all over this nation and be in churches sometime every Sunday and never hear words said about the poor. And yet it's where Jesus started and where Jesus ended. 
too often any real concern for the vulnerable is visible. I've been traveling this country for the last two years. From the Bronx to the border, from Appalachia to Aberdeen, the deep south to the California coast, and it has become clear that the pain in this nation must be exposed lest we suffer the judgment of God. I've heard, we've heard, Peter and I and others, from mothers whose children literally died because their states refused to expand Medicaid. Died. Not because God called them home, but because policies inflicted death. We've met with homeless families whose encampments have been attacked by police and militia groups. Right now, there's a plan in Aberdeen, Washington, to get rid of the largest homeless camp of, of white millennials, just wipe them out, rather than fix the problem. And they're trying to do it under the cover, under the radar. I've been in homes where across the street, they take the water from the city to a business or to a dog pound. But on the other side of the street, they won't run that same water to a house where children are. So the children drink contaminated water. Or as we went one place, a woman's backyard is so filled with raw sewage and there's so much mold in her house because of predatory lending and she can't get out of a trailer that she's paying $120,000 for that it isn't even worth $10,000. Her nine-year-old child has to use a CPAP machine to breathe. I've been in communities where Appalachian white people and indigenous families and urban African-Americans are suffering from poison water, not 50 years ago, not 60 years ago, today, today. And, and, and all these places of worship are there as well. We've read the reports that say over 250,000 people die every year from poverty. And we have all of these folk who claim to be conservative and say they love the Lord. Over 500,000 people living homeless, nearly 3.5, 4.5 million people who are in shelters, and 7.5 million people on the brink of homelessness while we have more than 18 million vacant homes in this country. I've been in places and walked the paths where beneath trees and bushes, children and mamas and daddies are living like animals black, brown, white, male, female, gay, and sometimes I'm brought to uncontrollable tears. Sometimes I don't know if seeing all this pain is going to shorten my life as it had, did my father's. When I see how in so many places politicians open their meetings with prayers unto God, good church folk come to service and ask God for more personal abundance and more personal prayers, and sometimes in those moments, it is though I can hear God speaking through the pain what God said to Isaiah. Can you hear it? What God said to the religious leaders and the politicians of Isaiah's day and Jeremiah's day. You want to know why it is that you fast and I don't look your way as a nation? You don't want to know why you humble yourself and I don't even seem to notice? Well, here's why. The bottom line is on your fast days, it's just for profit. You use religion for profit. You drive your employees much too hard. You fast, you, you, you go through the spiritual movements, but at the same time, you bicker and fight. You fast, you go through the religious movement, but you swing a mean fist. The kind of fasting you do won't get your prayers off the ground as a nation. Do you think this is the kind of fast day I'm after just to show humility? to put on a pious long face and a parade around solemnly in black 
You call that fasting? You call that something that God says that I would lie light? Oh, no, this is the kind of fast that I want from your nation and from my people. I want you to break the chains of injustice. I want you to get rid of exploitation in the workplace. I want you to free the oppressed, cancel the debt, bring the poor into your homes, and then I'll hear your prayers and the light will shine upon you and you shall be called repairers of the breach. Seems like I hear God's voice saying to the nation and to the church, it's time to come out of the exile of false religion. Come out of the exile of the religion of idolatry and self-worship that only sustains oppression rather than alleviates it. God's saying to us, I never change in this holy week. God is saying it again. Jesus is saying it again. I need somebody that will get in the cross line. Everybody wants to be in the miracle line, but will somebody get in the cross line and like me sacrifice for the cause of the gospel, for the cause of justice, because you want to conserve what you know God has said is true because God never changes. Come out of the exile of religion that serves itself and avoids the real people, avoids the vulnerable people whom God adores. We need a salvation. Yes, I want to use that language. We need saving. I want to use that conservative language like Dr. King said just two weeks before he was killed. America must be born again. The sermon he was going to preach that he didn't get to preach that he had sent in to put on the marquee was America may just go to hell if she doesn't address the issues of poverty, racism, and military. We need a release from the kind of religion that has liberally removed itself from the unchanging values of God and dad to call itself conservative because some things with God never change. A, the true conservative way would lead us and would say if we follow God's religious values of caring for the least of these, then we would find a way to use global technology and a green economy and targeted economic and infrastructure investment and total access to education and creative job creation strategies to address the ugly realities of poverty. If we would follow the conservative enduring ethic of love, we would beat our swords of racism into plows that would till the new soil of brotherhood and sisterhood. If we would follow the conservative call to see the poor as our neighbors, if we remember that we are our sister's keeper, then we would put the poor rather than the wealthy at the center of our public policy agenda. If we would just hold on to God's values, all the sick would have good health care. The environment would be protected. The injustices of our judicial systems would be made just. We would respect the dignity of all people. We would love all people and we would see everybody regardless of their race, their creed, their color, or their sexuality as creations of God. If we would just hold on to the heart, conserve the heart of what God has said, we would use our resources to develop our minds, our economy, rather than build bombs and missiles and weapons of human destruction. And that's the question before us. Do we want to keep on pressing towards God's vision? Do we want the high ground of a just, wholesome society? Or do we just want to go low? This is the question before us. And I believe that there are still some people who want what God wants. Some people who understand that there's some things with God that never changes. God has never changed his mind on how we should treat the poor and the vulnerable 
and the least of it. It's the most conservative thing God has ever said. I believe there are some prophetic people that have not bowed, who as a matter of faith, you know, you know it, and you hold on to it. You won't let it go, because you know that love is better than hate, and hope is better than despair, and community is better than division, and peace is better than war, and the good of the whole is better than the whims of a few, and God wants everybody, red, yellow, black, and brown, and white taken care of. God wants true community unity, true togetherness, not more separateness. God wants justice, always has and always will because some things will God never change. Jesus showed that if he had stopped healing the sick and feeding the poor and challenging Caesar and the false religious of, religious of his day, if he had not whipped the money changers out of the temple, if he had not preached the good news to the poor and told the nation they would be judged when they, when they mistreated the few, hmm, he might not have went to Calvary. But instead, he chose God's way. No matter how tough the cross of Calvary. You know, Jesus, Rome didn't know all about the atonement and all that stuff. They killed him because as a political threat, as a rebel, they hung him between two thieves, but the thieves in that sense meant those, those thieves were also those who were fighting against the society, the insurrectionists. No wonder the thief said, we're guilty. We've taken up arms, but this man nonviolently has done nothing but declared that Rome will not stand. The world will not stand. The religious cultures will not stand if it does not hold on to God's conservative concern for the poor. Jesus, as God incarnate, knew something. God is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. So let us remember that no matter what's happening and how antithetical things are now to the values of God, remember that. Remember that if I never see you again, hold on to the fact that God is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. Hold on to your faith. Trust that God is not impotent. Don't ever lose your hope, even in the midst of despair. Remember that there's still that God who can hew that stone of hope out of a, a mountain of despair. God's ways will always be exalted. Thus saith the Lord still carries weight. I don't care what the president says. I don't care what the Congress says. God's spirit still anoints and is able to strengthen and sustain us and empower us to show uncommon grace in a means world. God never changes. Weeping may endure for a night, but joy still comes in the morning because God never changes. Mean politicians might endure for a night, but joy will still come in the morning. We don't ever have to lose our faith. We might see some dark Fridays crucified on Fridays. Fridays socially dark, politically dark, economically dark, but we don't have to lose our faith because even on the cross, God is with us with us. If we stay there, one day we shall overcome. God's vision, God's dream will win out. We shall be called repairers of the breach. Crooked places one day will be straightened out. Rough places one day will be smooth. The poor shall inherit the kingdom of God. Those who cry now shall laugh. God's glory, God's power, God's way shall be revealed. That same grandmama that taught me applied theology. She also taught me, Father, that life has its ups and downs. And she said, when you serve the Lord, remember you got to have a melody in your heart. You got to have a song in the night. So she taught me to sing. And I've conserved it all these years. And when it's rough, when it's rough out there, Yara, when it's hard, when lies look like they're overcoming truth and meanness looks like it's overcoming mercy, I'm so conservative, I reach back, grab that old hymn, sing it on the plane, sing it coming down the runway, sing it in my car, sing it at night. You know what it says? It's, you probably haven't heard it because you're into all this new stuff, but I'm conservative. It says time 
time is filled with swift transition. Nothing on earth unmoved can stand. Build your hopes on things eternal, but hold to God's unchanging hand. Covet not this world's vain riches that so rapidly decay. Seek to gain the heavenly treasures. They will never pass away. And when she was old, my grandma was old. I mean old. And she seemed like she started hearing the voices of the saints calling from the other side. And she said, boy, I won't be here much longer because I hear them calling me home. She said, now make sure you sing this part of that song too. When your journey is completed, if to God you've been true, fair and bright, the home in glory, your enraptured soul will view. And then she'd wrap back her head and say, hold to God's unchanging hand. Build your hopes on things eternal. Hold to God's unchanging hand because no matter what this world does, some things with God never change. God bless your heart.